The gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark. We're going to be reading this morning from the sixth chapter, reading verses 14 through 29. It can be found on page 817 of your pew Bibles, if you would like to follow along. You may recall last week we read about uh, Jesus sending out the twelve, and uh, we're told that they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out demons, they anointed people with oil and healed them. And our reading today picks up right after that. So let us attend to God's word for us this morning. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Do you please pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our hearts and our minds be acceptable in your sight and yours alone. For you are God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. So, fun passage today, isn't it? (laughs) The Bible is a fascinating book with all kinds of things in it. This is one of those passages, if if you teach Sunday school to little boys, it's a great passage to go to. It captures their interest. Um, but this passage while it's about John the Baptist is also about a king it's about King Herod we hear about King Herod several times in the New Testament we hear about King Herod at Jesus' birth you may remember that the Magi go to him and ask where Jesus is to be born where the king of the Jews is to be born and And then Herod ends up ordering that all the little ones in Bethlehem be killed because he doesn't want a king to supplant him. That king we read about there was Herod the Great, but the the Herod we read about now is one of his sons. The Herod in this passage was a son of, of Herod the Great. When Herod died, his kingdom was divided into four parts. And tetrarchs were established, that is, kings of of a fourth of the kingdom. So the King Herod we read about today 
only rules about a fourth of what his father did. And this Herod, like his father before him, has, has a problem. You see, they're, they're kings of the Jews. Herod the Great, this Herod, which was Herod Antipas, and the, and the other tetrarchs. Yeah. They have that title, King of the Jews, because the Romans said so. But Herod was not himself a Jew. Yeah. He was actually an Idumean. Okay. He was... His claim to the throne came from a, a marriage into the Hasmonean dynasty. Right? You can read about Josephus and all those things if you're interested. The point being, his claim to the throne was somewhat tenuous. Right? And Herod the Great, in trying to, to establish himself as king and, and win the favor of the people, built up the temple in Jerusalem. Right? He made the temple in Jerusalem one of the wonders of the ancient world. People came from all over to see this temple. And yet, we sense that, that Herod never really felt like he'd won the people's hearts. And that goes for his son, the Herod we read about today. Herod, the King Herod we read about in this passage, seems, well, somewhat insecure about his place. And so he invites the, the leading people, he invites his soldiers, he, he throws big parties to try and, and secure his place, to win people's favor. And Herod's problem is that, that he's concerned about winning people's favor. He is supposed to be the king of the Jews, and yet he fails to acknowledge the true king. Yeah the king we read about in Psalm 24 that we sang today. Yeah. Herod is concerned about, about his own glory, his own reputation, rather than the glory of God. And because Herod is concerned about his reputation, about his standing, yeah. it leads him to do things that he knows are wrong. Yeah. You see, Herod knew that John the Baptist was a holy and righteous man. Herod knew that, that John the Baptist was teaching important things. Okay. But Herod allowed himself to be cornered, to be manipulated, to do things that he knew he oughtn't to do, okay. to murder this prophet okay. because he didn't want to lose face with the prominent people in his community. Okay. We're told that, that when Herodias' daughter comes in and, and says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter, Herod was distressed. He knew this was wrong. But because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. when we are concerned about our own reputations, yeah, when we're concerned about our own glory, yeah, we can end up doing things that we know are wrong. Yeah. We end up trying to please others instead of trying to please God. And it's fascinating that this, this king, yeah, this king who, who is supposed to be the ruler, the authority, the power in this place okay, finds himself powerless, manipulated at the whim of his wife, his daughter-in-law, or stepdaughter, okay, and at the whim of his own ego, his own drive to glorify himself and maintain his reputation. What a contrast with that other king we read about this morning, King David. When we read about King David this morning, we, we read the story of when they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Yeah. And you may recall the Ark of the Covenant was, was a, an item, a, a structure made uh, by the Jews when they were in the wilderness, made at God's command to God's specifications. 
And the Ark of the Covenant contained the tablets that had the Ten Commandments upon them, as well as containing manna from their, their travels in the wilderness, containing this, uh, the staff that Aaron had. This Ark of the Covenant was, was a, a symbol of God's power. It was like a throne for God as king. And David was bringing it back to Jerusalem so that, that God could be worshipped there. And David and all Israel worshipped God with all their might as this was being brought in. And when they arrive in Jerusalem, David's wife, Michael, the, son of, or the daughter of Saul, the previous king, we're told that, that when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. And yet, David, we find, is not concerned about what he looks like to others. If we go a little past the passage we read this morning, we read where, as David comes in, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of, the, of slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. She tries to shame him and tell him how foolish he looks. But David's response is to say it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. And David goes on to say, I will become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes. You see, David's one concern is glorifying God. He doesn't care how he looks. He doesn't care what opinions others have of him. His one concern is to glorify God, to glorify the king who has made him king. And so David is willing to, to pay the cost of being humiliated in order to witness to the truth that God is the only one worthy of being glorified. Herod and David represent two different ways that we, we approach life. Herod, who was concerned about his own reputation and glorifying himself, unwilling to, to pay the cost of putting his own ego away. In contrast to David, who only wanted to worship God, to celebrate this God who had brought his ancestors out of Egypt, who had established him on the throne, and who had promised to him a coming, a coming savior, an eternal king. It was that king that John the Baptist gave witness to. John the Baptist gave witness to Jesus Christ, who is the eternal king. And John the Baptist paid the cost for his sticking to that witness. Each of us is, is often faced with situations where we have to decide who we're going to glorify whose reputation we're concerned about. And oftentimes, we find ourselves looking foolish if we try and honor God. We find ourselves, like David, being humiliated in front of others and being asked to pay that cost. Because the truth is, if we are going to follow Jesus Christ, we are going to look like fools at times. I mean, seriously, who gathers in a, in a big room that's often not at the right temperature on Sunday mornings when they could be out golfing, when they could be sleeping in? Yeah. How foolish is that? Yeah. How foolish is it to, to take the hard-earned money that you have made yeah. and to give, give a portion to the church for God's use, to, to give it away, yeah. To, in charities, to sponsor a child in Africa. 
How foolish to take what you have earned and, and let others use it. Right? How foolish is it to take time out of your, your day right? to serve the least of these, right? to work in a food pantry, to, to build houses for people that, you know, they're probably just lazy, right? We look like fools when we follow our God. That is a cost that we are, we are asked to pay yeah. if we are willing to glorify the one who made us rather than try and glorify ourselves. Yeah. There is a cost to discipleship. There is a cost to witnessing to the truth we know in Jesus Christ. Yeah. But there's also the reality that the cost that we pay whether it is being humbled, whether it is being poor, whether it's being ridiculed, yeah. whether it's being asked to do things we never thought we could or would do. The cost that we are asked to pay is nothing compared to the cost that has been paid for us. Because this king we worship, this king we follow, yeah, has paid the ultimate cost for us. Jesus Christ was sent by God as a witness of God's love yeah. to offer himself up for us yeah. so that in his death our sin is forgiven, we are reconciled with our creator. Yeah. In his resurrection, death is defeated yeah. and we have access to eternal life with him. Yeah. Jesus Christ has paid the cost for us so that any cost we pay in following him is as nothing. So who are we going to be like? Are we going to be like Herod, concerned about whether we look like fools, concerned about our reputations, concerned about our own glory, or like David, who is willing to say, I will become even more undignified than this, in worshiping the God who made me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.